Greenberg. Uh, my prior experience is in pharmaceutical company. And 16 years ago, I founded, and today I'm the CEO of uh, the largest uh, grower packer shipper of produce in Peru. Uh, this explains my vision of the growth uh, of agriculture and the potentialities of growth of agriculture in the less developed countries uh, towards exports. The reason I see more uh, towards export than for local markets is because uh, today the rich countries, namely Europe, UK, America, and all Asia that foresees the, the, the ocean, around 3 billion stomachs, uh, these are the income growing countries, and they are import dependent for food. So, if we in Africa, Latin America, where I live and, and work, if we try to just produce for our own people, being already net exporters in most of the in most of the cases, what will happen is that prices will come down uh, in our internal markets. So even though we will have higher yields, higher output, the the, the big companies will replace the small farmer because of higher productivity and this will be bad for the for the small scale farmer. In order to uh, articulate the small care small scale farmer to the chain of growth to the chain of value we need to articulate them to a chain of exports because then they will have some kind of liaison some kind of uh, uh, articulation with the rich markets it's very feasible today drivers of value are changing. It's not only about output, it's not only about kilos or pounds, it's not only about yields, but it's ab about different, like what I call wrapping paper of what we export, namely environmental issues, social issues, ethical trade, uh, ethical trade initiative, fair trade, um, growth of uh, women, uh, women in work, all these issues are considered when exporting. Uh, value preservation, cultural preservation, and as we all know, agriculture has what is called multifunctional uh, values. Uh, it's decentralized away from the cities, it generates a lot of work for women, for low education women, it preserves uh, environmental uh, basins, uh, it preserves cultural values. So that's the reason the rich countries are adding to the drivers of value in agricultural products all these issues. And the guardians of all these multifunctional non-food non output of agriculture are the small-scale farmers. So we, we think that there's a lot of possibilities to incorporate these small-scale farmers to the big agriculture trends but we need some cultural changes in their own way of production and we need some changes in the uh, state policies in each of the countries that we produce. We have had uh, different experiences, some good ones, some not so good. As I said before, we are the largest grower, packer, shipper of produce in Peru. We are servicing almost every day five different countries and 31, five different continents and 31 countries. So we are very close to the regulations and the drivers of value of each of the markets that we serve. Uh, on the average, they are all very aware of three issues, social issues, environmental issues, and safety issues. Regarding the safety, let me begin with that. No more toxic agrochemicals. If we are to export, we cannot use TEMIC for nematodes. Or we cannot use this product or this other product, I don't want to say brand names. We need to move forward to, to the list of each country. Each country has a list of accepted good chemicals, and we need to stay with that. Uh, small-scale farmers need to understand that they need to fulfill this, that just once 
that they don't, they will jeopardize the name of the company that is doing the contract company for them. The second issue is social, uh, social issues. Uh, even though uh, these huge chains that are the final clients uh, seem to be very powerful and very large companies, uh, on, on the reality they are very fragile. Just one TV uh, report saying that they are selling asparagus or avocado or grapes or uh, Holland Tau or sugar snap or whatever, any fruit, coming from a from the less developed country where women are not recognized in their rights, where you have child labor, where you don't pay overtime, or, or, or you don't follow the rule, or you don't keep the all the international treaties regarding social issues, that, that chain, the day after, would be like a desert. No consumers. The, 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 the big consumer in the States, in Europe, in UK, they won't go to shop in a store after this store has been spotlighted for having products that it's, it's uh, misproduced without fulfilling the social issues. And exactly the same for environmental issues. What do we do with all our waste when, 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 when we use chemicals that come in plastic bags? What do we do with that plastic? What do we do with the physiological needs of all our workers? We have 4,000 workers, 2,000 workers, four workers. It doesn't matter. Where do the physical needs of them go every day, every single day? All this has to be audited, certified, to be sure that this chain won't be uh, pointed as a as breaker of these uh, social and environmental laws. So, my answer is, it's very possible, there's a tremendous opportunity for small-scale farmers to articulate these big trends, there's a need to do so. Uh, the first world doesn't want only big companies selling to them. They want, they, they are promoting, they, they are very, very actively, th through their own departments and through NGOs, promoting these articulations. But the small-scale farmer needs to accept that the drivers of value today are different. They are not only about pounds, about kilos, they are not only about food output, we have a very big list. First, it's an issue about taxes. I, I, in my readings, I found out that in many countries, the, the tax relationship between this small care farmer, the medium person who, who, who buys it, and who sells it to the big company, to the grower, to the packer, to the shipper, it, it's adding and adding and adding taxes. Uh, here in Peru, we have a problem today with coffee. The, large, the number one export of Peru is coffee, one, $1.5 billion. And there's no a single place with 100 acres or 40 hectares of coffee at once. We have 150,000 small scale farmers. And we produce one of the best coffee. We're the number one special coffee exporter in the world. But still, we have problems of taxes because uh, our rules and regulations are done for the big grower in Lima, are done for the big company, for, for the entrepreneurial, and they are not done thinking in the small uh, co-ops uh, back there in the jungle. The same happens with the cacao. So first, we need to review uh, all the chain. So only the last one who export pays the taxes. The, the product has to pay the taxes just one. If, if we want to articulate, it, 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 it means that it's going to go through many hands. And it cannot, the government cannot collect taxes in each and every hand, because that's not fair for the small one, who is the last in the chain. Second, we need education. To understand all these different drivers that I was talking before, uh, the grower, in the case of Peru, over one and a half million growers individually, how is he to understand that today there are different drivers through education? We need a lot of workshops, we need a lot of education for them to understand the different drivers. We need a, look, a lot of success examples. Nothing leads to success as the example of success. So we need to work 
and grow and spiral with the help of NGOs, with the help of the chains, with the help of the large companies who already know this idea, we need to work and it will grow in spiral. Uh, so we need to promote this, this process of education. Third, we need fin finance. Uh, big companies get financing through the big banks, uh, whether local or international. But how do small-scale farmers get to finance? Peru has an example of, uh, I don't know how to say it in English, of uh, small financing with, a, with a, a different kind of banking institution, which are not really banks. Uh, we, are, we are near to begin with this money through the telephone. I mean, we need to, to understand that this small-scale farmer has different needs of financiation and, and somehow, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, somehow we need to put all those resources for them to be available. And the rest, and uh, I'm not proud to say this, we need to stick. Uh, we need to stick because those small-scale bat farmers, and I'm sure we're going to find a few of them, they are jeopardizing the name of the country, they are jeopardizing in which they belong, the name of the company with, for which they are doing, with which they are doing uh, contract farming, and they are jeopardizing their own community. Just imagine that in London, you, you read in the Times one morning that uh, some green leaves from this specific town, whether in South America or in Africa, generated 14 intoxications. Do you think, what, what would happen with all the exports of that town the day after? So you only need one, two or three poor uh, small-scale farming to jeopardize for a whole community. And that's not fair. So for those, we also need the stick. Uh, and, and I say it in fourth place after saying education, financing, and, and the good examples.